Our gospel this day comes to us from the 12th chapter of the gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, we've been, this is the year of Luke, but Lent and, Lent and Easter tend to bring John's stories. This involves the story of uh, <clears throat> a back to Bethany, where for those of you who remember, you know, this is the place where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, just, you know, just a couple chapters before in John. And he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And here's a story of Mary doing something and the response that it causes. And this is just the week before Jesus' death. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you will, do, will not always have me. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. One of the things um, I like about Tucson is the fact that you, you look around, there's not a lot of big buildings blocking the way. So you get clear views of you know, the mountains. And in fact, there are certain building codes in certain places where you can't build up very high, so you're not blocking other people's views. But I know that there are some people who like the big city kind of thing. And I heard about three guys from the small town, Bill, Jim, and Ted, who were firefighters who had an extended break, and they wanted to go to the big city to just see what it was like. Well, not being very savvy with the big city and everything else like that, they kind of did some booking on their own, and one of them discovered this really great rate downtown in the penthouse suite, 50 bucks a night. The 75th floor, they're like, this has got to be great. So they get there, and they check into the hotel, at which point they found out the reason why I said penthouse is 50 bucks a night. It's up on the 75th floor, and the elevator's not working. Now, they're like, we're firemen. We can handle this. This isn't an issue. This is, we've done that tower challenge countless times, but let's be smart. So they check in, get their stuff, you know, but they decide not to go up to the room just yet. They said, let's go and see some of the sites, and when we come back, we'll go up and take our luggage up with us. Good thinking. So they go and have a wonderful time out in the town seeing some of the sites. They park their car, and they start heading up, and they're like, 75 stairs, is, the stories is still an awful lot. Well, here's the thing to make it move faster. None of us can sing. But how about, Bill, you tell jokes for the first 24, 25 stories, Ted, you still tell jokes for the next 25. And Jim, you've got the last 25. Okay, it'll help us pass the time. So they go up, and Bill tells jokes for 25 floors. And then Ted tells his. And Jim, you know, it comes to that, you know, 51st floor, nothing. And then the 52nd floor, and then nothing. And they go, wait a minute. Jim, you're supposed to be telling jokes. Oh, that's right. Let me start with the story about this funny guy who left the room keys in the car. A lot of wasted effort there now, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you ever done something where you just, you, you get in so far into something and all of a sudden you go, oh no. You know, um, one of the things that people say is an important thing to do, if you are thinking about getting married, what you need to do, aside from pastoral counseling, which you might need to do before and after this, is that you and your beloved should go to Ikea to buy furniture, bring it back, and have to put it together. 
if you can survive that, you're probably golden. But how often do you take a look at some of these things and, well, I don't need to read the directions that closely. And then what's this little piece for? <laughs> you know, when you get done, you, you go, wait a minute, I did all this stuff. And it's like, well, it was a wasted effort. Sometimes we do, you know, we have certain activities or things, you know, we go see a really horrible movie and you go, well, that's a few hours of my life I'm not getting back. We might have an experience of something where you go, gee, what a waste. You know, either financially or time. We go, why do we even bother? Sometimes you look at certain decisions you made in life with the benefit of hindsight and go, what was I thinking? What a waste. I could have been doing this instead of this. What a waste. What a waste, Mary. 300 days wages. All right? So put that in real term. Take your 10 months pay and blow it on something like that. And notice the key word I'm using there, blow. Because that's probably what we're thinking. Think about the fact that, you know, the guidelines for buying an engagement band is two months wages, right? Just for the record, that guideline was developed by jewelers. Okay. And some might go, you know, I mean, what did you do with this money? How can you waste it? And all that kind of stuff. And sometimes someone might come to you with some pithy statement, sometimes pseudo-wrapped in religion and goes, well, God has a plan. God has a plan? That's good to hear. Why wasn't I on it? Or God's plan was for this to go this way? Really? Just for the record, when I come back from sabbatical and I have plenty of time, I would love to sit down with each and every one of you as one big group and explain to you how awful a theology it is to say, well, God has a plan when someone has a bad situation. Because it makes, in short, it makes your bad situation seem that God had something out for you. Do you really want to go down that route? Again, when I come back from sabbatical, we can unpack that a little bit further. But sometimes, but oftentimes we say that in a well-meaning attempt to try to say, whatever you went through was not a waste. That there was something good that came out of it, a silver lining of some sort. You know, but what's the silver lining of Mary? Ten months of income for one very smelly but nice-smelling day. What a waste. What was she doing? What was she thinking? Huh. Well, this was the one that sat at Jesus' feet when he came through that one time while Martha was busy preparing everything. So maybe she knows how bad his feet smell? Just a guess. But it's not about that, is it? As Jesus it mentions, she bought it for, to prepare me for my, for my funeral, for my death. Hi, I would like 500 gallons of Chanel number no. 5 to dump on somebody who's going to die in a couple of weeks. That seems a little odd, doesn't it? So what's Mary up to? What is this act of love about? But then again, there might be some of the biggest concerns that some of us have about waste. And it often has to deal with love. Did you feel like you loved the wrong person at some point in your life? And sometimes it wasn't returned. You invested a great deal of energy and emotion. And you go, there's a waste. Really? 
I will tell you something quite plainly. In college, I dated this one girl through most of college. In fact, I decided that she should be my wife, and I proposed to her before graduation. Went out and put as much money as I could together on an engagement ring. We graduated. Hit the other real world. Let's not kid ourselves. College is a real world. Any of these things are real worlds at the moment. But the next phase of life was not going to go well for the two of us, shall we say. And we broke up. So it was God's plan, of course, that I find someone and break their heart and break mine. Right? No. Well, but what a waste. In the, is it really a waste in the moment? Is love ever truly a waste? Is caring ever truly a waste? Now, I will say that, you know, there, there, you know, there's, everything happens for a reason. You want to talk about another bad phrase. But one of the benefits of that time, because of my experience and because of the situation I found myself in, I was forced to ask myself real questions about what I wanted in life and who and what was going to help me get there. It's prepared me for the next relationship, who's been married to me for 27 years, and she's wondering why she didn't prepare herself more before marrying me. But, you know. but it prepared me for the next. And any and all situations can prepare us for the next things. Who we are today is entirely created by everything that happened. The things you call good, the things you call bad. And none of it was a waste if you use it. And in and all that was God. Not trying to, here's my plan and you're not following it like you didn't follow the instructions from Ikea. But laboring with you in those moments Carrying you when it hurts, rejoicing with you when you are celebrating, rising with you each new day. We sang that in the opening hymn. Is that a waste? Is that a waste of what God has done? Remember the, the, the parable Jesus told last week about the young son who asked for his inheritance and then blew it. We normally call that the parable of the prodigal son, right? And we go, well, yeah, of course. He was given all this stuff and he wasted it. Well, wait a minute. Is prodigal like prodigy? No, prod prodigal has to do with prodigious, excessiveness. It has to do, in a sense, with wastefulness, which, honestly, if you look at a child prodigy or anybody else you call a prodigy, you tend to go, well, why do they have so much? How do they deserve it? There's a judgment, actually, behind most of that. But was the young man and the young son the only prodigal in that group? Or was it the father who gave of all of his inheritance and rejoiced and celebrated when he came back? And was the elder son the one who refused to get involved in the party, the one who pouted in the corner, the one who was upset and carried a grudge? Was he being a prodigal because he was wasting everything that his father had given him because he didn't feel like he got more. And ultimately the question of 10 months wages of beautiful perfume on feet, is that a waste? Or how about the fact that we nailed the Son of God to a cross because he taught us to love one another? Said forgive. Give. Be kind. I don't know what's a bigger waste in the world than taking the Son of God and killing him. And yet he did it. 
Is it all part of God's plan? God has a way? Well, yes, God does have a way. God's way is life. Our way may be death, die. But we know the story doesn't end on Good Friday. God's way is about love, not hate. God's way is about forgiveness, not judgment. It's not about hatred. It's about kindness. It's about compassion. It's about mercy. It's about grace. Which, let's face it, can seem to be the biggest waste of all. Did they deserve it? Did they earn it? Of course not. It's grace. But you get it. Not again because of what you've done or anything else like that. It's about whose you are and the fact that he said love. He said grace. He said mercy. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. May you go and do likewise. May you receive this gift of grace. And may you be prodigal with it. May the perfume of your good words, your good deeds, let that light so shine before others. May that fill the air with the aroma of love. For everything has been placed into your hands. In love. So love one another. And remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen.